Let's take our Bibles and turn in them to the first book of John, the first epistle of John, not the Gospel of John. First John chapter 5, and we'll be looking at just the very first statement in that verse. I feel like I have a very simple point that to get across, but it's not always the easiest thing to do. Um, we'll be looking at 1 John chapter 5, verse 1, and let's pray before we go on. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can come to you and um, bring our requests to you, the needs that we have. We know that it's because of what Jesus Christ has done for us that we have this access to your throne. And right now we ask that you would help us and bless us. Help us, bless us with understanding of your word. Help us to respond to it in the way that you would have. And I pray that as I speak, you would be able, your spirit would be able to use the words to bring glory to yourself and to your son, Jesus Christ. I pray that um, whatever needs are here, you would meet through and with your word. And I ask that uh, those here that have not turned to Christ for salvation would understand better what it is, what it means to be born again. And those of us that are in your family would understand better what it means to be your child. And I ask that you would help and bless through this message. In Jesus' name, amen. There's um, an idea in churches and in the Bible, it comes from the Bible, that's why it's in, this idea is in church. There's some ideas that are in churches that are not from the Bible. This idea is from the Bible. And it's the idea of, of a family, of course, and that the people in a church are part of a family. Um, I was in this verse mentions uh, an aspect of that that really struck me as I was studying the passage. I couldn't get past the first line, and so um, I felt like we should just stop there and consider some things about this. And the more I thought about this verse, um, I feel like maybe the easiest way for me to express what is being said here is to talk about family. What is a family? Now, I know all around the world, Families are different. There's not one family that's the same as another family. You might talk to somebody and say, oh, you did that in your family too? Sure, but that's surprising because we all have our own families and, and we all, every family's different. But God made us into families and so there's some things about family that is the same even though the, the uh, particular traditions or things that you do in your family are different. Um, there's some aspects and characteristics of a of family that is the same. And one is that we know we belong in a family. Okay? I, I was thinking about this, and there's so many different ways to think about this, but um, when you're a part of a family, you, you have, there's a sense of belonging. You belong there. And with that sense of belonging is security. Um, if, you, if you're, as a child, there was, I'm sure there were times when you were, fear came over you, and um, you took care of that fear by getting close to family, particularly dad, or maybe it was mom. But um, you, there's different situations we're in. We, 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 um, we feel security because we're a part of a family. Uh, you know, there's an, there, I was trying to look up ways to try to talk about this, and I, there's something out there called um, family privilege. I ran across that term, family privilege, and that is something that you experience in a family. If you come from a good family, you have family privilege. It's something that you experience that you don't even know you have. And, you know, it sounds like psychology talk, but I thought, that's probably true. There's probably families that are so messed up today, uh, some families so messed up today, some people grow up in, in a situation that's hardly a family, 
But um, if you grew up in a family, especially if you grew up in a Christian family, some of these, these characteristics of family are, are, are a source of encouragement to us and a help to us. You get nourishment from being in a family. You get, you, you get fed. You get taken care of. Um, that's because your family cares about you. There's protection. A family pr provides protection from, um, w from people that would hurt you or, and provides protection from just nature. Most families live in some type of a shelter. Um, there's a, in a family, people act boldly. If we saw, um, you could see two people interacting with one another, and you think, they must be family. Because they wouldn't interact together, they wouldn't talk to one another, act toward one another if they weren't family. But there's a certain boldness between family members, because you're family, you understand each other, you talk to one another a certain way. Um, people in a family, even though every one of us are individuals, people in a family often have similar actions. Um, that you, you say, I, I mean, I don't know, you've probably all had moments like that, you say, that is just like a Dameron, or that is just like a Vogelin. Only a Vogelin would do that, or that is just like, we have similar actions. Um, we even, sometimes we talk alike. There's been many times, um, I would stick my head out of my office door, and it, it happens that my office door is right next to where a preacher's office door used to be. I'd stick my head out there and call somebody's name, and they would, they would respond right away. Because <laughs> they thought it was somebody else's voice calling their name. But we talk alike. We express things. We say things in the same way as others. You know, um, it's probably, I shouldn't joke. I won't say that. Sorry. Um, we think alike, we look alike. Um, you can tell, you look, you look at a family portrait and you can tell that they're all family members. Then there's always the, the one that doesn't look like and all the rest of the family teases them that they, weren't, they, were, they just came along. But so there's, there's we, we, we all can smile and grin because we all, we can understand what the idea of family. A family is something that's unique and it's very special and it's a relationship that, that is not equaled anywhere else in, in the world. Think about um, what you do in your family that I couldn't do in your family. I don't, I can't, I just, there's, if I came to your house, I, I mean, okay, so if you, how many of you, you're taking the kids up to the door? after Sunday school. Do you walk right in the house? No. But the kid, they just walk right in the house. They, why? Because they're the child. You're the stranger, but they can walk right in. If you're with somebody at their house, um, even if they say, make yourselves at home, have you ever really done that? <laughs> no, you don't, you don't make yourself at home because you're not part of the family. You're not part of that home. And if, if, if we were, I just, I'd like to try to imagine that you were, you were with someone who is just very unaware of this idea. I don't, I mean, of course, I think everybody in the world knows what a family is. But just, if, if there was some way that somebody didn't understand how families worked, and they were with you, and you were in your home, and you were just living normally, like people do in a family, you do, just help themselves to things and just talk like you would in a family, and this other person who's never seen a family act, they would be shocked at the way that you lived and the way that you interacted with one another. And um, they might even think, wow, I would like to be able to do what you do. And if they asked you, they said, Can I, you know, could I be like you are in this home? You would say, no. How, and they might say, well, wh why or how did you come to be in this position of being in this family? And what would you say? You were born into that family. It's very simple. 
It's very simple. If you want to be a part of the Dameron family, you have to be born into the Dameron family. If you want to be a part of the Vogelin family, you have to be born. In, if you want to be part of the Hall family, you have to be born into the Hall family or that Hall family or the you know, whatever family you have. It's very simple. Just very simple. If you want to be a part of that family, you're born into it. But it's not necessarily that easy, right? Being born into a family is simple, but it's not necessarily easy. I don't remember the struggle that I went through to become born into my family, okay? But you mothers remember the struggle that you went through to bring a person into your family. It was simple. They had to be born, but it was a lot of work. It was a struggle. Somebody, if somebody said, um, some people think about being a part of something, and, and, and I'm, we're in church, so I'm, I'm going toward the idea of being part of the family of God. Some people think they're in the family of God uh, because they live in the same country as other people that are in the family of God. Probably not so much now, but in America a long time ago, probably it's getting longer and longer ago, people thought, well, I'm an American, I must be a Christian. But think about how silly that is. If I came to Mr. Hall's house and said, I want to be a part of your family, he said, well, you can't be a part of my family. I said, well, I live in the same country that you live in. I want to be a part of you, you, I can't be in the same family just because I'm from the same country. Um, some people think that they're in the family of God because they go to church. So, does that mean that we're all part of the same family? Physically? I mean, I could come to Mr. Hall and say, I want to be a part of your family. Well, you can't be a part of my family. I'm the Hall. You're, you're a Vogelin. Well, but we go to the same church. I want to be a part of, can I be a part of your family? Well, no. And you can't be, you can't be a part of the family of God just because you go to the same church as other people that are in the family of God. You, um, some people think that you can be a part of the family because you act the same way. We said that people in families act the same way. If I could get down Derek Edwards' vocabulary and I just started to talk, talk to like Derek even better than his children do. And then I said, no, okay, Derek, I, I know how to talk like you. Can I be a part of your family? All these illustrations are kind of absurd, aren't they? But a lot of people think, well, if I just talk like a Christian, then I, then I must be in the family of God. Um, do the things that, um, that people in a family do. If I just, well, our family, we always have this tradition. Well, you start having that tradition. You always do, a, you always go to church on Sunday or something. Just because just you always go to church on Sunday doesn't mean you can be a part of a certain family. Just because you do certain things doesn't mean you can be a part of a family. You say, well, I know, I know, the, I know who the father in that family is. Well, so, so what, right? Okay, I, I know who Bruce Leak is. I know who the father is in the Leak family. Does that mean I can be a part of the Leak family? No, I have to be born into the Leak family to be. A, even though I can know who the father is in that family, it doesn't mean I can be a part of that family. And it's the same way with the family of God. Just because you know who God is, doesn't mean that you can be a part of God's family. So this very first statement. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 1, tells us how that you can be a part of the family of God. Because in order to be a part of the family, you have to be born into it, don't you? And John says here, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Now, there's other places Jesus said you must be born again. John, John told us that. John tells us in John 1, 12, as many as received him to them, gave he power to become the sons of God. But here again, John gives us a very simple statement, a very simple statement that explains to us how to be a part of God's family. Because in order to be a part of a family, you have to be born into it. And here he says, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Now that's a very simple statement. But it's not so easy. It's kind of going to be a secondary theme through this, through this message. 
Some things that are simple are not necessarily easy. We have a track that we like to use, God's simple plan of salvation. It is simple, but it's not necessarily easy. It's not just like, it's not something flippant. What do these words mean? Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Well, the whosoever there is, is pretty simple, and it's pretty easy to understand. Whosoever means anybody. Anybody. There's no limit on who can be born of God. There's no limit on who can be born of God as long as they fill in the rest of those words between whosoever and born of God. There's no limit on it. If you're here and you're not a part of the family of God, you can be a part of the family of God. You can't do it by being in a country where a lot of people are part of the family of God. You can't do it by being in a church. You can't do it by doing certain things that other people that are part of the family of God do. You can't do it by dressing and looking like people that are in the family of God dress and look. But you can be part of the family of God. Everybody can be part of the family of God. So the Bible says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. So what does the word believe mean? Do you think it just means that you have heard it before and say, well, that sounds like it's probably true? There's more to belief than that, isn't there? Some people, um, you, you see signs going down the highway, you see the big sign says, Jesus is Lord. Okay, now that's a true statement. That's a true statement. But you think everybody who sees that sign and in their mind says Jesus is Lord is on their way to heaven? No. I mean, even though the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, you know, they confessed it with their mouth. They said, Jesus is Lord. I wonder what that means, they might say, right? That doesn't mean they're saved just because they say it. Even, and so just because you say that you believe something doesn't mean that it's true. Saying something isn't belief. Also, knowing something isn't belief. Um, in school, or in other situations, maybe not even just in, in, uh, in school, in other situations, we can, we can say, well, yeah, I know that's true, but I'm not ready to commit myself to it. And I, I've heard that, um, I don't know, I can imagine um, tonight's the hall night. I can imagine Mr. Hall, he's got his engineering degree, and Mr. Hall and Mr. Hall Jr., they get together, and they, using... And, and Mr. Schreiber would be a part of this. Is he translating? He would be a part of this too. And they, with their engineering minds, figure out some way that to, to put something together that they're convinced would hold me up. You know, I don't know, they make it out of who knows what. It's not steel. Something questionable to me. And I say, okay, I know you're an engineer, and I know that the laws of engineering say that this is, material is strong enough to withstand the weight of my body, and hold it up. I believe you. What are they going to say? Why don't you try it out? Well, you know, it's not that I don't think that you're a good engineer, but I don't know if I'm ready to do that. Okay? You've heard stories told about tightrope walkers and all of that type of thing. But belief is not acknowledging that you can see how something is true. When the Bible talks about believing, it means believing to the point of changing. Believing to the point of changing. And what it is that we have to believe in order to be born into God's family is we have to believe that Jesus is the Christ. Who is Jesus? See, a lot of people understand and would say, sure, Jesus lived on the earth. I believe in Jesus. Okay? But believing that Jesus lived on the earth and, and believing that Jesus is the Christ are two different things. But who is Jesus? Of course, he was promised by God. He was born of a virgin, the Virgin Mary. At the time we celebrate this, his birth at Christmas time, Mary and was in the line of David, and so Jesus was uh, the, the, in the ancestry of King David, who God had promised uh, uh, someone to sit on his throne forever. And so he's the son of David, and he, he, grew, he was born, he grew up 
through a, through a childhood like each one of us have. And when he got sometime past the age of 30, he began a ministry. He ministered. He lived on the earth perfectly. Never sinned. Was tempted just like we are, but he never sinned. And yet he was crucified. He was, he was executed as a criminal. He was executed as a blasphemer, as someone who, who, who made himself to be God. The, the worst of crimes. And of course, it wasn't a crime because he was God. And he proved that. God proved it to us by raising him from the dead on the third day. And Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, the same one that was born in a manger and died on the cross and ascended into heaven, is coming back someday. We don't know when. It could be today. He's coming back. That's the Jesus that John is talking about here when he says, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. So what does the word Christ mean? I know, I, hopefully this is not just a Sunday school lesson. But G Christ is not Jesus' last name. My name is Jeff Vogelin. All of us, we have a last name. Christ is not Jesus' last name. He's not Jesus Christ, like there's a Joe Christ and a Mary Christ. And no, it's not his last name. It's a title given to him. That's why in the verse it says, Jesus is the Christ. Whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And so who, what does that mean, the Christ? It's, it's interesting to me that um, in the coordination of things, uh, God arranged it that way. We just finished teaching in our Bible club on the prophets of Messiah. And Daniel was a prophet in Daniel 9, uh, 25. He mentions, he gives the, the word Messiah. And I'm going to read it here. You can turn to it and look at it if you'd like also. But Daniel 9, 25 says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Messiah, Daniel mentions Messiah the Priest, or Messiah the Prince. And so Messiah is a Hebrew word. The word that means Messiah in the Greek language that the New Testament writ is written in is the word Christos, or Christ. And so when John says, whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christos, he's saying whosoever believes that Jesus is the Messiah, is born of God. Now who's the Messiah? What is the Christ? Well, the Messiah, or the Christ, that word means anointed one. Now we don't, we don't practice anointing people in our church here. But in the Old Testament, they did anoint people. Do you remember? There's many different times when people were anointed. There's a large ceremony, a lot of words used to describe uh, in, in Exodus and Leviticus how the priests were anointed. The priests were anointed. The high priest was anointed. The, the priests that did the daily sacrifices were anointed. And so the priests were anointed. Um, there is... Uh, uh, God came to Elijah one time and said, go anoint, I think it was uh, Jehu, to be king and Elisha to be prophet. And so um, prophets were anointed, and of course kings were anointed. Uh, we, we, you know, Saul was anointed king, and that's why David over and over again said, I won't touch, don't touch the Lord's anointed. Of course David was anointed, so Solomon was anointed, the king's of Israel were anointed. And everyone who understands scriptures understands that when the Bible speaks of Jesus as the Christ, or whenever it speaks of the Messiah, the Messiah was somebody who was an, the anointed one that fulfilled all three of those anointed positions. The Messiah would not just be a priest. The Messiah would not just be a king. And the Messiah would not just be a prophet. In particular, he would not be just that prophet that Moses said would come. But he would be all three. He would be prophet, 
priest, and king. See, Moses had promised. Everybody looks to Moses. The Jews today still look to Moses because he, he, God used him to give them the law. And, but Moses said, there's coming one after me that will tell you even more of God than me. Him you should listen to. Of course, the Jews have not listened to him because he is here. He's the prophet. The prophet that Moses promised is here, and he's the anointed one. He's Christ. And the priests, the priests were given to the people of Israel to make sacrifices for them. And those sacrifices were to atone, to, to cover for their sins. And Jesus Christ is the pr priest, after, not after the order of Aaron, but after the order of Melchizedek. And he stands forever, making intercession for us and atonement for us. And Jesus Christ is the king. God said he would set his king in Mount Zion. I will set my king in Mount Zion. And Jesus Christ is that king. He's not sitting there now, but he's the king. And he will rule from Jerusalem. And he should be obeyed as a king. See, all of the offices of the Christ or the Messiah... All of those anointed offices are in one word, the Christ. And so, while it's simple to say, whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, it's not so easy to believe that Jesus is the Christ. It's not so easy to believe to the point of changing that Jesus is the Christ. You see, Jesus is the prophet and what he says his he's god himself so what he says is god's words and so when he speaks we ought to listen to him as if it's god speaking because it is god speaking if you believe that jesus is that prophet the anointed prophet that would come after moses you're going to listen to him and obey him as if you as if a Jew like a Jew would obey Moses. And that's not so easy to do. Not always. It's not so easy. In my thinking this one is the easiest, but this is not so easy either. It's not the easiest thing to believe that somebody who lived on the earth I live on the earth, and I know my capabilities. Somebody else who lived on the earth could die, and that death of some other man could cover for my shortcomings. But of course, he wasn't just some other man. He's the Messiah. He's the Christ. He's the, he's the virgin-born Son of God. And so, while it's simple... It's simple that someone who's perfect could live and die in everyone who's not perfect's place. It's not the easiest to, 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 to believe to the point of changing, to, to resting in Jesus Christ, saying, all right, he said it, I'm trusting that. And then, while it's simple to understand that another person is a king, it's not so easy to Treat him as a king. We, man's root sin is, to, is putting himself on the throne. <laughs> is saying, I'm going to do what I want to do. Is saying, yeah, I think that fruit looks good and I think, it's, I think I think it would make me wise. And so I'm going to eat of that fruit. See, when, when we sinned as mankind and when each of us sins, the sin is us doing what we want to do. And, and that's the way we're, that's the way we're, we've, that's the way we fell. And so we're bent toward rebellion. We're not bent toward submission to a king. We're bent toward rebellion. And while it's simple to say, Jesus is the king, he's the anointed king, it's not so easy to believe it to the point of saying, yes, he's my king and I will obey him. And I will allow him to rule over my life. 
But these are the things, the simple things, that must be done in order to be born of God. John said, Whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. You must believe that Jesus is the prophet of God. And all that, all that he says and teaches are the words of God and must be obeyed since they are from God. And you must believe that Jesus is the only priest who can make atonement for our sins and intercession to God for us. And you must believe that Jesus is the king of all the earth and one day um, he will rule from Jerusalem and he is to be obeyed now as the ruler of my life. Simple truths. But they're not so easy. They can only be believed to the point of changing by the grace of God. God's grace, the gift of God's grace allows us, opens our eyes, the Holy Spirit comes in and changes our sinful heart to the point where we say, yeah, I believe that. And I don't just believe the words, I believe it to the point of changing. This that God does to us, by grace, Paul, are you saved through faith, right? Not of ourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The gift of God is eternal life. You know, every one of our families, part of family is people being born and people dying. But when you become a part of God's family, you're born into that family but you never die because God gives you eternal life through Jesus Christ, Jesus the Christ, our Lord. Let's bow in prayer. Before we pray, we'll give a moment for those that are going to be baptized to head back for that. I just want to maybe just repeat something here. Are you here tonight and you're not a part of the family of God? Say, so I don't understand that family of God stuff. Well, let me put it this way. Do you know that if you died tonight, you'd be with God in heaven? If your body died, you'd be with God in heaven? If you don't know that, you're not part of God's family. Those that are in God's family have the security that he gives, have the assurance that he gives. And it's a simple thing to be a part of God's family. You have to believe that Jesus is the Christ. He's the lawgiver. He's the prophet. He's the, he's the priest. He's the one that makes atonement for our sins. And he's the king. He's the one that rules in our life. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can call you Father, that we can come to you through the blood of Jesus Christ, your Son, who died on the cross so that anyone who turns to him for salvation and repentance can have eternal life. I pray that those of us here tonight who have done that at some point in our lives and, and are in your family would understand this better, would understand the privilege that we have and would seek to live in a way that would please you as our Father. Actually, as the rest of the verse says, that if we're born of you, we love everyone else that is born of you also. And I pray that those here that have never been a part, that have never come to you through Jesus Christ, trusting in his blood, his death for salvation to become a part of your family. Pray that you would convict them, that your spirit would prick their heart, and that they would know that they're lost. And I ask that you'd give them courage to um, come during this invitation 
or talk to someone else who they came with or that they've met here, that they, they know here, and, and look to the Bible for whatever remaining questions they have and turn to Christ for salvation tonight. Pray that you would be glorified through anything and all that's done in this invitation. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand together. Uh, stand there at your feet or at your seat. And um, I encourage you, if the Lord has convicted or challenged or encouraged you and you feel a need to pray up here in front to do that, I encourage you to make this invitation time a, a time of meditation and prayer in your seat. And then if you don't know that you're on your way to heaven or you know that you're not born of God, you're not a child of God, I encourage you to talk to somebody and um, we would be happy to show you, that, show you um, that through with with somebody here tonight. If you'd come forward, talk to the pastor that's down front, and he can guide you to somebody that could answer those questions for you. As the instrumentalists play, you come if it's if it's needed.